First of all, my name is AJ O'Neill. I am uh, Rust Curious. I run the Rust Meetup, but it's more out of happenstance than out of expertise. I really think it's a great uh, a language and opportunity, and I am following it so that I can ride the wave, much like I did back in the old Go days. I wasn't actually a big Go person at first. Now I am, but I, I kept watch on it to see where it was heading and what was going on with it and knew that it was you know coming any day and then it came and that's been awesome. Anyway, um, so I'm familiar with Node, I'm familiar with Go. I'm a little bit familiar with Rust, but we're gonna let the experts uh, or beginners that have more experience than other people in the room uh, chime in as I say things wrong. Yeah, uh, well, only can... Levi's an expert. Well, Levi, yes, Levi is an expert. <laughs> Unfortunately, he is not here today. Um, but we're going to go over concurrency models, and this is actually going to be pretty simple and straightforward in terms of we're just going to talk about a few of them, and then it's going to be Q and A. So most of this is going to be Q and A. Uh, with all that out of the way, uh, yeah, we'll just, this is supposed to actually be slides, but something didn't go quite right, and so it's showing up as a markdown file, which is okay, I guess. So I'll just scroll through this. Anyway, slide one, all the concurrency models of the rainbow. Yay! Uh, first, what is not a concurrency model? So I... I, I want to make sure we're all clear that if something is is blocking, if it's single threaded and it's blocking, it is not concurrent. And that is that is the definition of, of not being concurrent. And if you've ever used Python, then you are familiar or Ruby, then you are familiar with the terribleness that that is. Uh, this is how you construct the same terribleness in Rust. You could attach a listener to an address and you could just iterate over each stream that's incoming. And what you would be able to do with this is handle one stream at a time. So as long as you're handling the one stream, you are not handling any other stream. So this would be single file. Uh, this, is, this is the Walmart model in the worst possible way. This is everybody's in a single file line and there's only one register and you were sitting and you were waiting for the register to be available. And the whole time that the person in front of you is unloading their cart and getting items scanned and everything's going on, you were doing absolutely nothing. You were sitting there waiting. That is the blocking model, the old terrible way that uh, lots of things work. <coughs> and there's all sorts of Apache mod this and that because Apache would handle the threading model and the programming language would be running separate entire copies for every single visitor. It was, it was badness. Then the next thing, which would be its own slide and nice large print here, would be concurrency versus parallels. So we know what is not concurrent, what is not parallel. But the other issue is considering the difference between con concurrency and parallelism. So I will give you something that is only concurrent and something that is only parallel. So if you have a for job and jobs, I'll take a bite while they're getting the door in there. Sorry, I mean, I got a seat down Hey! Oh, it's the other expert. We love you some We're safe. I was pulling this weed from like, wait a minute. This is about the weed address. Oh, crap. It's way far away. Another like 22 minutes, yes. That's why. We got more sticker variants. We got poop here for it. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Good, because I have one Do I need to chip in? Five bucks would be great. All right. Uh, do we can do that after. Yeah. He takes cash for electrons. Oh. Okay, so if I'm doing something in parallel, it's typically I'm doing the same thing. That's what we're talking about. So I'm batching many different things. So we take the Walmart model where there's one register, and now we say there are four registers. So there are four lines of people standing in line, waiting, unable to do anything while they just stand there and wait. But there's four lines, so we can go through it faster. And then there is. Do we get the equivalent about the pros and cons? Let's point you might go through all the bottles first. 
<laughs> I, I want to go through all the bottles first, okay. and then let's quibble about pros and cons. So then there is concurrency means essentially that something else can be done while you are, while nothing is being done. So this is a JavaScript example, a front-end JavaScript example. Imagine you had a bunch of buttons on the page, and each button has an event listener that is a click listener. So if we had these 10 buttons, you could press any single button, and that button could do an action. So I could press the first button, and then I could press the fifth button, and then I could press the second button. So I can press the buttons in any order. I don't have to wait for button one to be pressed in order to press button two. There's no backlog. Each button can listen to a click and each button uh, when clicked can do something. However, in this particular case, only one thing can happen at any given time. So if you click button one and button one has to go do something while it's doing that thing, you cannot be you cannot click button two, or if you try to click button two, there will be no response because it is the, the, the web thread is not yet ready to respond to the next thing you want it to do. Now, in the case of a button click and doing something like console.log, you wouldn't be able to hit two buttons fast enough for that to have any effect. But let's say that you had a loop that counted to 100 million. That might be slow enough I think 100 million would definitely be slow enough that it would it would halt the thread and you would not be able to click on button two. Wait for database query. Well, that you that in JavaScript does not calculate because JavaScript is concurrent by default. So you would be that would put you back in a wait state. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. So any questions about blocking, concurrency, and parallelism? Because if we understand that, then we're in a really good place. So we're using parallelism in the sense of multi-core and concurrency in the sense of await, I think await. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But you can you can mix and match these. You can also do things in parallel and concurrently. And so, for example, in Node.js, you actually do get I wouldn't call it parallelism, but you get multi-threaded because the threads happen on the back end. So when you do that database query, the thread that's handling that network request is happening. It's just happening in a place where you don't deal with it. So there can be as many database queries going on at a time, but the, the main thread in Node.js can only do one thing at a time. If you have a json.parse or a json.stringify, uh, console.log, json.parse, json.stringify are the, are the three top things that make Node not be able to handle a sufficient number of requests because those are the things that take up a lot of time that people don't realize they take up a crap ton of time. And they scale really, really badly. So if you do a small json.parse or json.stringify, you won't notice it, but as you linearly increase the size of your payload, that you're stringifying or parsing, you're exponentially increasing the time that it takes to process it. So it can be really, really efficient for, say, if you want to copy a small object, there's probably no more efficient way to copy a small object than json.stringify, json.parse. But if it's a large object, then it becomes very, very inefficient. Um, I mean, for the button example in the browser, you could also use uh, web workers, right? To get some sort of concurrency so that other things can happen. Yes, yeah, so if you wanted a web worker that counted to 100 million, mm -hmm. you could click the button and you could put that in a web worker. And that is essentially a thread. Mm -hmm. A web worker is about as close as we get to threads in JavaScript. Anyone here old enough to remember cooperative multitasking on Windows 3.1 or Mac OS? What did you say the name of it was? Cooperative multitasking? I don't remember that. I, don't know by that name, but I believe I know what you're talking about because I'm familiar with it. It's not like everything old to do again because concurrency with everything going on in your app was that in the main message loop, you said, wait for the next event. It at that point is yielded up potentially for the operating system to potentially have some other program that slice the CPU time to do something. But if you were doing lots of stuff with your thread, 
everything else would be on hold until you said, okay, wait next event. Yeah. So, yeah, so yeah, that that would be weird. What was a CPU processing power to have a multi-threaded operating system? The overhead was too high. So the advantage of this thing here is that uh, the, the, well, the blocking operations are more naturally turning things over than that one call of wait next event that you had working in back of Windows. And I think you have to be a good citizen when running an app. You bring everyone else's app to a halt. But I think back in those days, the other problem was we didn't have multi-threading yet anyway, because that was introduced with the 386 or the 486? Well, the 386 made it feasible to do that, really, but the operating systems lag behind that. But like in the current the concurrent one, even on a single thread, it's very low overhead to handle those multi-things compared to the overhead of, there is a price that you pay for running multiple threads. Yes. Okay. If you only had one core. Mm -hmm. Well, Regardless of how many cores you have, there's a price you pay. The, the, the more the threads have to contend for any cores. Oh, okay. the, the, whole, the whole issue of copying the stack memory and pulling a stack down, you weren't doing that in a concurrent system. Okay, so then this was supposed to be just a slide that says threads. At which point, <clears throat> I would say what I'm going to say now. With threads, you're essentially dealing with what is a task that can run on a CPU. A thread has, so when you start your program, your program has one thread. And that thread has a call stack, which is basically the variables that you're using in any given function that aren't being shared between many different functions. Uh, if you're coming from the node world. That is kind of what a, a call stack is. So in the node world, you don't really know about the stack and the heap because it's all just kind of magic away. Um, but the optimization is basically this. If a variable stays local to a function and doesn't uh, get assigned uh, as a reference to something that's in a different scope, then it will go on that function's stack. And if it is the, the, op the opposite case, it will go on to the heap. And in the old, 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 old days, if you think of a stick of RAM and it's got chips on the stick of RAM, the stack would fill from the bottom. And every time you call a function, it would create more stack space for that. And every time a function completed, it would pull down the stack space. And then the heap would start from the top. And the heap would be all of your large objects or things that you want to keep around for a long time. And back in the olden, olden days, things would crash because the heap could get fragmented and you couldn't make allocations anymore. But we don't have that problem anymore because we've got computers with over four gigs of RAM and better allocators. Uh, and in Rust, you just haven't written big enough programs. <laughs> yeah. Well, do you, but wait, do you still, is, is stat, or is heap fragmentation still an issue on modern computers? Yes. So it could still happen that Especially you could have. big games when you're doing your own slab allocation. Okay. Yeah. So the, the thing that I heard about this being a problem was war stories, Ars Technica war stories. I'd have to pull up the episode, but they were talking about how. Mm -hmm. They basically were never able to launch their game because they hit the four gigabyte virtual memory restriction. And no matter how much they optimized, they could have, say, 50% or 60% of the RAM free, but they couldn't allocate any more RAM. The worst case scenario is that you've got small heap allocations mixed up with large heap allocations. So you might have four gigabytes free of RAM. But unfortunately, you need a four gigabyte chunk, and you have a ten byte allocation right in the middle, and so there's no continuous segment. Mm -hmm. um, in the so, old in the old days, you used to have handles to memory, so the operating system had a way of sort of redirecting the memory under you to make all that work. Um, but it, it is still an issue. Yeah, but to to your point, it's not as bad as it was. That's right. You have to be you have to be in that yeah, yeah, one percent of weird stuff to worry about it. So for most software nowadays, you probably would never run into it unless you're building a game. Unless you're building your own engine for your game. Science, scientific and computing a game, something with huge amounts of data working at the same time, mm -hmm. most web transaction stuff. No. Right. Machine learning, some big ETL. So in any case, 
you can think of the stack as something very clean and very fast that's relatively small and it's like a stack of books like every book you put on the stack you have to take a book off to get down to the book beneath it whereas a heap is more like a bookshelf where you can take off books and put them in any order and if you need to put in an encyclopedia volume but there's the never-ending story in the way then you can't fit your encyclopedia volumes in that space on the bookshelf because you can't get the contiguous space in order to allocate. So that's one of the problems with, um, with just heap and stack and that really applies to everything. But when you have threads, each thread has its own stack for, for all intents and purposes, each thread is its own program. And so it has, it has its own stack. It has, I guess they share the same heap, but it takes up a lot of a lot of space and there's this concept of context switching, which is that anytime a CPU needs to switch between threads, uh, especially before what they now call hyper threading, which is just like you can switch threads really fast. You can basically queue up the thread that's gonna run next on the CPU, on the CPU ready to go. And then the CPU will switch between two threads very, very quickly. But still it's a problem, it's called context switching. So you have a lot more memory that you're using when you use threads and you and it's a lot slower because every time you need to switch between tasks the cpu basically has to say okay i'm going to take this chunk of program that i'm running i'm going to put it on pause i'm going to go put it in cache or throw it away for now and get it from ram later and then i'm going to check, take this other program and i'm going to load it and then i'm going to start running it and so if you have a thousand threads and each one of them is a web request and they each need to do small little things, then you get thrashing of the CPU where most of the time that the CPU is spending is loading and unloading threads rather than doing the work. So the CPU can be very efficient at doing these tasks as long as the programs are not written super, super inefficient. But that's, they also run out of RAM just from the stack, like the 10,000 connection problem. So, what is it, eight megabytes per? Depends on your OS. Two two megabytes is really common. It's configurable. Yeah, but it can be eight. Yeah, like Apache Tomcat or anything. Is it, if you had 10,000 simultaneous connections, you'd use all your RAM just for the stacks. Yes, because each really thread has its own, as a, as a dedicated so amount of stacks. Which, uses a couple hundred which is how, stack. with all the virtualization of RAM and things being thrown all over the place, basically, the stack is allocated contiguously, guaranteed. Oh, excuse me. Um, and we got some people joining in from uh, YouTube and Twitch. So hello to all of you. Uh, thanks for joining in. Uh, feel free to comment with questions. And I'll try to look over here when I'm looking here. I'm looking at the comments. So I'll try to look over here occasionally and catch so that. Threads can be easier to reason about than current programming, especially when the logs are involved and so forth. But you pay the price of the overhead of swapping things around in the memory. So one of the things that you could do in the old school way, which maybe I'll just touch on this briefly and then move on to event loops, but the old school way is you could actually take function pointers, which again, you don't have to worry about that kind of stuff in, in node land, because we've got a couple of people in this that are primarily node developers tonight. Um, you, you basically could, could take some function pointers, put them over to the thread and then have the thread run something. And when one thing is done, have it run the next thing. And, and so you could have a, a mutex and an array and just be pushing functions over to the thread. And every time it's done running one, have it run the next one. And so this is a way that you could, you could pool some threads. And instead of creating a new thread for every function, you can just have some mutexing logic and then push the functions to the thread. And this gives you a little bit more control in the software labs to make sure that your threads are running efficiently and you have fewer threads for the CPU to switch between. Um, and then that, if you take that pattern and you make it generic, that is what an event loop is and that is what node does. So node has a uh, C library called libuv, which is abstracted for the different threading models across the different operating systems. And every time you have a callback or a promise in node for something like disk access, network access, um, anything that has to sit and wait, instead, it will put that function onto essentially this thread pool 
and it will let the threads do their thing and the event loop will run. And whenever a function has completed, then it will queue that up to fire an event into the main thread, which is where you, you get your promise completion or your callback calls. And that's, and that's essentially the node model is you're just being more efficient with threads. But the problem with the node model is that you only get one thread that you are in control of. All of the other threads are abstracted away from you. And this is to protect you from memory corruption. And this is particularly important in the browsers the way that they were back in the 1990s because memory corruption is how you uh, design worms and uh, exploits and gain privilege escalation. That's how you take over somebody's computer is you get some some memory to you identify a, a, a chain of events in which memory becomes corrupt and then you find a way to get your code to be where something else is supposed to be so that a function that you've designed would basically be imagine you pre-compile a program and then you ship that pre-compiled program into somebody's function pointer and then the program goes to run the function and instead of getting the function that the program was designed to run, you've replaced that function with your assembly code, and then it just runs that instead. And this is this is how the exploits of the world work. Can I interject a really layman's example? Just while yeah. I'm on that move. So I mean, it's like if the thread is just my hand, and I want to, you know, send this over to Pizza Line and have it do something, instead of just sitting here and waiting for it, I could also come over here and send this over to Pizza Land. And now Pizza Land can tell me, you know, I'm done with that Mountain Dew. And so as soon as I'm done, you know, putting this one over here, I can know, okay, let's pick up this one and do more stuff with it. So it's just a way to keep things moving along um, without, you know, blocking them and saying like, well, I have to wait for the Pizza Land to be done with this one. I take it back. Now I put this one there, wait for it to be done, put it back. But, um, yeah, so it's just a way to keep things up. Keep it moving. Exactly. I thought faster as well, faster or shorter cook, all these orders come in. Could be a lot of stuff on the grill that take different amounts of time, time to cook. And when something's ready, the cook says, Oh, this one's ready. I'll serve it back up to the main thread to go do something with it until the next thing's ready. I'll serve that. Yeah. So often, what the, the thing that I was going to say, but I forgot to say, is that, that, that this is what I call the Starbucks model. So you've got the Walmart model, is you've either got one and everybody's blocked, or you've got many, but everybody's blocked. Starbucks model is. You go up, you place your order, you sit down, you read a book, you do whatever you want to do. You're completely free to use your time however you want to use your time. And then when your number is called, then you go pick up your latte. And that is that is the node model. There is one register. There's one barista. There's as many or one person taking. There's just one register. It doesn't matter who's taking the order. Uh, and there's as many machines in the background as there can be but there's only one point of entry. That's, that's Starbucks, that's, that's Node. Now, if you go into the, some other models, then you get the best of both worlds because you can take the Starbucks model and the Walmart model and say there's many registers and you can go and sit down. And that's like the food, the food court model, which is kind of what we'll talk about uh, next. So uh, I wanted to interject a little there. Uh, what was that? Uh, yeah, I wanted to say something about, uh, uh, I think I heard you say that uh, thread pools help with, uh, uh, help reduce context switching overhead. Uh, is that right? Uh, yeah, thread pools. So, yeah, we, well, yeah. not the thread pool, sorry. I said that the wrong way. A thread pool is technically just when you have threads that are ready and waiting. Right. The, Complement to that is what the thread pool is waiting for. So if you pull threads and then you have some way of communicating what the thread should be doing next, that's where you get the efficiency, not in the act of creating the threads, but in the act of having data ready to go into the threads and then be reused. Right. Right, so, so you still have the context switching overhead, but you don't have the, uh, uh, the spawning uh, overhead, I guess. Well, you reduce the context switching overhead because you can limit 
the number of threads to the number of cores you have for a CPU. Sure. Yeah. And with hyper-threading, you get 2x. So you could reserve, what, I, what I'd say you do is if you have eight cores, you could run 15 threads because right. hyper-threading will allow you to not have context switching between most of them. And then you want to reserve one just for the main loop of the application and not let it have any, not let it be overloaded. Right, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So, next, channels. So there's channels and coroutines, and goroutines are all kind of related. Uh, Rust has channels too, but it it doesn't really do goroutines. It does async await, but all the same. Um, I guess channels are not really part of concurrency per se, but they are a way of communicating information. So back to the Mountain Dew example. Uh, so one thread is instructed to put the Mountain Dew right here. And then the other thread is instructed to put the Mountain Dew right here. Oh, I can't do it, error, right? And then there's both threads are instructed to put the Mountain Dew right here. And then you end up with uh, three quarters of a can of Mountain Dew and the rest of it is in lost memory space. So that's the, the problem with, with this model is just you can tell the CPU to, you, you have multiple core CPU, so one thread can be running on the CPU, the other thread can be running on the CPU, they can both access the same RAM at the same time, and then you end up with corrupt memory. Uh, you know, so you can imagine in the physical world, we can't smash those two cans together, but just imagine we were in the quantum world and the cans just like came into each other and then they were both there simultaneously existing, overriding each other's existence. I thought we were talking about Rust. Rust isn't going to do that to you. Well, you can't have, have that happen in Rust. Oh, we're generic. about to say why. Oh, yes. Okay. So, God, sorry, I apologize. Yes, that cannot happen in Rust because of the borrow checker. If you try to do anything that would cause memory corruption in Rust and you do not have the unsafe option turned on, then the program literally will not compile. Does Go Channels have any set threads around that? So Go Channels, yes, and I'll get to that in just a second. Any other questions? Yeah, I'll just go into that. So with Go, the Go routines are essentially lightweight threads, pardon my French. They, they do the thread pooling behavior that I talked about where every time you create a Go routine, it puts a function pointer on a stack for a thread that is available to run. With Go, you can still have that same problem of accessing memory locations at the same time in the same place. So the motto is don't communicate by sharing memory, share memory by communicating. And channels are essentially syntax sugar over mutexes. And a mutex is a way to tell the CPU before you attempt to write to this memory location, read or write to or from this memory location, stop and check to see if it is in use by any other CPU. So there is some overhead to a mutex. It does have to stop and think for a second. But that stop and thinking for a second prevents memory corruption. A channel is just a, a pretty syntax sugar to declare a mutex such that you, it's almost like calling a function. When you send something through a channel, it's, it's essentially equivalent to calling a function that has a mutex lock, a data assignment, and a mutex unlock. But because there's a little bit of syntax sugar there and it has these paradigms of, of don't communicate by sharing memory, share memory by communicating, it helps aid people to think a little bit differently. Now, you cannot use channels in every place that you would use uh, a mutex. It, it won't do the right thing. You can get mutex locks from channels. If one channel is sending and another channel is waiting, 
uh, and they're dependent upon each other, you can get into a lock where neither channel can send and neither, neither channel can receive. So the same types of problems that you have with mutex locks, you have with channels, but if you design your channels according to the build philosophies, you shouldn't run into those errors. And there's an excellent blog post by one of those four main dudes of Go that, uh, because there was a lot of people that started saying channels, 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 channel all the things. And he came back and said, no, channel most of the things because in most cases it makes sense to do so. Don't bend channels over backwards to make them do things that they're not designed to do. And he outlines where a channel makes sense and a mutex makes sense and where, uh, I don't know, something else, maybe it was an atomic, an atomic makes sense. And an atomic is essentially the same thing as in, in the sense of a, of a channel, you tell it that you want to send data and it's like calling a function. An atomic is a variable that when you go to read or write to or from it, it is, it, it is syntax sugar around the same thing where it will lock a mutex, do the read or write, and then unlock the mutex. And mutexes, you can have, you can have write, read, write mutexes, and you can have uh, read only mutexes. And the difference between the two is it generally doesn't matter if multiple things read data at the same time. Like I can look at the scan while you can look at the scan. What we can't do is we can't both write to it at the same time. We can't both place the Mountain Dew in the corner of the pizza box at the same time. So generally with a write mutex, when you activate a write mutex, nothing can be done, not reading or writing. But when you have a read mutex, it just says, hey, I'm reading this. No one can write to it, but anybody can read from it. I like to think of go routines or channels like just like Elixir and Erlang. You're avoiding the conflict from memory. It gives you a way of declaring, I'm giving this data over to you. And I'm not going to act, and I cannot access it anymore after that point. Once I put it to the channel, there's no way in my code I can go back and try it. Well, maybe you're a rook or a hacker or something. I don't know, but you're basically saying, I've given that off. There's no way for you to go back and access that. So there's not going to be the possibility of having that conflict. Yeah. So in Rust, you're actually moving things across the channel. Yeah. And on Go, if you are just on a single thread, it's basically going to act like you did, right? In that case. Because it still kind of mimics that, like almost like a JavaScript generator, that flow. Yeah. So until Go 1.6, it was 1.5 or 1.6, something fairly late, uh, Go wasn't actually multi threaded. <laughs> um, and then the day that they changed it to being multi threaded, tons of stuff broke because people were writing programs that wouldn't work in a multi threaded environment. They just didn't know that they had never been running in a multi-threaded environment. It was running like that. It's similar to the very first time I started playing two cores or two CPUs on another board, we had a lot of C++ code that broke. Because what we had before really was the concurrent situation and not the parallel situation. Yeah. Without realizing it. We had designed for concurrency but not parallel. Yeah, that was really painful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was yeah. a I was a little bit too young, just just a few years too young at the time, so I didn't experience that pain. I, was like, I didn't experience it programming, but like I remember getting my first multi <coughs> CPU and just everything I was used to wasn't working. I'm like, I don't know why this is breaking. Took me a little bit, of catch, a little bit of time to catch up. Yeah. Part of the magic of Go channels or, or Rust, if you have really high throughput in a multi-thread environment, if everyone's always waiting for the mutex, that avoid locks. That everything runs slowly. But it, but well, would, would it be by the borrow checker or by channels and Go? If you can somehow declare things that yes, people actually are not going to be sharing information, so there's no need for a mutex. Or if there is the coach challenge really just a tiny little time to serve an old stack or not, then you avoid, you can truly run in parallel without waiting for exclusive access to memory. Right. And that's one of Rust's promises is fearless concurrency. Uh, and placing really fast speed. 
Yes. Faster than a speeding bullet. <laughs> so then we get to the, the last bit here. And, and somebody mentioned green threads earlier, so I think we'll have to circle back and talk about that. But the last bit here, Go does not have this. Uh, Node has this, but it doesn't matter because it's just syntax sugar. It uh, doesn't actually mean anything. And in Rust, async await is actually meaningful. And I really don't know too much about it other than that you can have multiple uh, event loops and whatever, whatever pattern you pick, which hopefully nowadays would be the one that's built into the language because I think there was like three competing standards in total for futures and promises and async await and rest that were popular. Well, we, we still have the issue that the syntax is built into the language, but the runtime yeah. is not it's built not. into the language. You have to pick your runtime. So vertically, yeah, yeah, they did that because it's in one instance. So you can have competing libraries for runtimes. Like, well, Whole now it is like core Rust maintained, right? Is it the there, there's, yeah, a so there's, there's a standard one, yeah. but like in an embedded system where I want to have the minimum footprint, part of why they did this is if I'm running a very small embedded environment, I don't have room right. for a lot of stuff. So by it being a library, as opposed to being part of the language itself, I don't have to have that running in my embedded environment. But because it is a library, that means you can so choose to have a different runtime library. We have a bit of a complex of versions of libraries because until this came out, there was, I mean, now we have like three, I think. There's two major ones. There's Tokyo. Yeah, you Tokyo, Tokyo standard. basic standard. And then there's the, the IO green stuff. I'm not oh, sure yeah. exactly how that is. Tokyo is still popular than basic standard. It, it was around before, so a lot of people were used to using it, and they sort of moved the new, the new, new syntax. But like a node where, you know, like Henry Ford with the Model T, you know, I mean, you want along, it's black. There's only one runtime for everything, so people never have to worry about compatibility because it's a highly opinionated framework. What's the white fit password? Uh, startup 01 or startup 02? Startup 01 or 02? Yeah. Oh, share password. Yes. Oh, well, I don't have to share it because you got it right. Did I get it right? You must have because the share thing went away. You must have used that before. Or it could be just timed out because it was a while ago. Well, anyway, magic. Well, if you make it come up again, then I will click the yes it share. It came up again because it. So thus quoth the good book. This is actually not the good book. This is the lesser book. The well, good I, book. I like the O'Reilly book better. But uh, okay. Well, yeah, I, it's definitely this one's That's got more detail. Edition, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Second edition. Got it under your recommendation. Actually, I don't remember if it was your recommendation. Yes. But it probably it, was. The last meetup. My second recommendation. Just for that. <laughs> yeah. So I'll I'll just remember. What do the kids yes. call it these days? Shilling. I'll shill this book. I'll put a Amazon link in the description. If you make a post on Reddit and you recommend something okay, to someone, right. they call it shilling. Oh yeah. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, it's like, well, so there, oh, okay. I'm gonna take a brief side tangent for no more than one and a half minutes. <laughs> so I figured out how to rip Blu-rays the easiest way possible. And there are mega threads that say, well, here's the 50 Blu-ray players that have ever worked with this method. And here's the 40 different firmwares that you can cross flash between them. And I found, well, if you use exactly this Blu-ray player, which is the cheapest in its class for having the criteria that are necessary and you know, cheapest, most reliable, best value, let's call it best value. So if you get this one that is the best value, and you get this thing that is the best value, and you get this thing that is the best value, then you will be able to rip your Blu-rays without spending hours of your time or ripping out your hair. And so I posted that on Reddit, and then they gave me a bunch of flack. And it's like, you do realize that the alternative is that someone has to go through the mega thread and then buy some of these drives, and some of them will work, and some of them won't, and some of them will get crapped out. Like, just... Let me post the answer that everyone actually wants. And it was one of those things where everybody upvoted it, like, but then it was removed for violating, you know, for being unsafe for the community. It's like, seriously? Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. So, 
Are there any other uh, concurrency models you have on there? I don't have any other concurrency models on here, but what I was going to quote from the book is use, state, use async standard task, net and task. And so you can use the version of net that is async standard and you can use task instead of thread and it looks almost identical to the thread example. So if you just go through your examples and replace net and thread with async standard net and task, and everything should make you happy and feel glorious. So that's probably an important point to call out. Async standard, that, that <coughs> platform is designed to look like a standard library in which it wants to be. So that's sort of the whole ideal behind it. And Tokyo is just like the first executor out there and like plowing forward, trying to figure it all out. So they just figured out and got it working first. It's been very like, successful. I mean, yeah, they, they were, Tokyo works with it. They were very successful and they did a lot of rewriting to make it with the new syntax. It still is. Yes. I'm curious about it goes long term. Are you familiar with software transactional memory as a memory sharing instance? No. Closure uses this to share its memory. Thank you. It works like a distributed database in that if I have a distributed database and I have to do a lot of reads and writes, I've got the issue about potential conflict. And how do I do that without grabbing a mutex, which could lock everyone else out from using the system? What they do is that you take a snapshot of how things are, you have a transaction log, like a transaction to database to say, okay, I'm gonna do these things. And then before you say commit, you go back and check the current state of the memory that you were dependent on. And if that has changed on you, you abort the transaction and start over again. But if it hasn't changed, then you can commit. So basically it's saying that, hey, I'm going to bet Rather than grabbing exclusive access, I'm going to bet that most of the time this stuff isn't going to be changing underneath me. And I can just take a copy and do what I want, but before I put the new value back in the table, I have to make sure someone else has it and changing that first, or else I have to start, start over. And it's uh, it, it, it's neat. It, I, you can, you, I, there's no need to do it in Rust. <laughs> you can't use any other language, but for some reason, Enclosure, that's the one they decided to go with. Hmm. What is What is the syntax like on that? Is there any special syntax to it, or is it just an under the hood copy on write type of thing? It's been a while since I did closure. Um, my memory is basically, you know, they had atoms and things like, you're basically saying, here's this thing I want to put my memory stuff into. And we sort of had to declare some sort of data structure around that to say, there's this, there's this stuff I want to share or do something with. And the operating system has a library that wraps around that and new transactions and such. So if you are directly accessing the, the variable, you have to have this variable wrapped in this in this library. It's been a few years, hmm. but the, but the, but it's, it's exactly the same logic that you would use to distribute a database where you have to do write or both reads and writes across the distributed system without getting into the blocks. That's where that's where that came from the same research. Closure is a night of the best. There's lots of parentheses. On the, on the JVM. Hmm. Somebody on Twitter was mentioning, why don't we get people to learn functional languages more? And it was like, name a functional language that has a standard distribution that's easy to use. And they were like, uh, uh, not list. But well, it sounds like maybe. This. If you ask the question, is Rust functional? It's, of course, a functional paradigm. But one of the fundamental things about a functional language is supposed to have immutable data. And why is that important? Well, it's supposed to make things easy to reason about, easy to do concurrency. But you don't necessarily need immutable data all the time in Rust because the borrow checker tells you when it's safe not to have immutable data. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's a force of function, but it sort of, it sort of makes part of the, one of the axioms of functional programming not necessary. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I can do map reduce and all of the functional stuff and I can interview they want to, but I don't have to worry about the data sharing because the firewall checker didn't exist back then. And I was looking at just how big the Rust compiler is. If you tried creating the Rust compiler back in the 1990s, you would not have had enough memory in your system or enough computer time to compile anything. I mean, all that extra check, static checking to do, mm -hmm. that has a price. You just could not do it back then. I had a guy in one of the courses who had an old MacBook Air with two gigs of RAM. He couldn't compile any of our examples. I was so sad. I was just like, 
Hello world. <laughs> you could do hello world, but nothing significant. Because, you know, with two gigs of RAM on modern distribution, you've got like zero available RAM. Doesn't Rust give you the option to turn off a lot of flags? Yeah, you probably well, could. But you, you can turn off the optimization. In a tutorial, right? right. Yeah. You, you can turn off the optimizations, which take more time. But the fundamental borrow checker to make sure that everything you do is thread safe and memory safe. They, 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 they couldn't do that in C++ 20, 30 years ago because the compiler would just take forever. So if you're in C++ design these days, there's a lot of vendors out there that, share, that sell tools that will go analyze your code and find things they think are wrong or dangerous to you. And there's a false positive rate list findings and so forth. And it's like, well, all that static analysis is just built into the Rust compiler. If there's a, if, if it sees something that, if it sees something that I can't guarantee is safe, sorry, you can't compile. And that, uh, that's what my first month back in my head against that. Yeah, I think that's how the rest is coming in as a, you know, very senior level engineer to not have something that like you pick up at the weekend, right? Oh yeah. I had to use Go at work and I was like, okay, I learned it in a day or two. Well, that, that, that's part of the promise of Go. That, and that, that is, well, that is even, one of the goals of Go is that it is something you can learn about like That is but explicit. That any but I wonder, like, popular modern languages right, right now. Because I started with assembly language in C. And uh, the guy who did Stack Overflow, forgetting his name, Joel Spolsky, thank you. He came up with a law called the Law of the Abstractions, which is we keep on making these things to make it easier for people to program and not worry about the messy details. But none of these abstractions are perfect to isolate you from all the bad stuff in all cases. So we reduce the amount of time it takes to be able to know the learning curve to get to where you can get something running. But we end up increasing the amount of time it takes for you to become an expert to be able to debug all the things that might come up in production. And so when I, I like the Rust because I like understanding what it is being that close. But if, I'm really using close Java, but if I'm using JavaScript or if I'm using Python or using these other things, it's like, okay, am I going to be running into a case where to figure out what's going on? I need to figure out what's really going on in those libraries in isolation to go deal with the issue that I, that I have to deal with. So, you know, if, and if Go successfully abstracts you from or know where it is, abstracts you from all these things you have to worry about, hey, it's great. But I do is a lot of times in the past, if I said, well, 99.9% .9 of the time, yes. But that 0.1% of the time, no. And I've worked in medical devices and other things where you just absolutely have to guarantee that you know exactly what's going to happen and, and you're not going to have a problem. And I just really love the guarantees that the rest has that if it compiles, yes, you can have logic bugs. But as far as all the other stuff about things working, it's, it's pretty solid. Right. Yeah. So do we have do we have any questions? How many people we got online? We got any regulars? Yeah, they're still online. Let me check and see where the people are online. They're in this town. Hey, the Jitsi yeah. chat. Yeah. Did you bring those last time? Oh gosh, uh, so there was a whole ton a, of chat that went on here that on I just crack. missed. Do you need any funds for this? Uh, so I don't know how often yeah, yeah. I it's usually it's only go when they're on sale. In, in the programming that I do, I have concurrent, I have things that have to go, happen concurrently or in parallel, but I have a only a small number of things I have to worry about at a time. So for ease of reasoning about what's going on, it's easier for me to set up a thread that just worry about monitoring and take care of that task. You take care of part of that part of the machine, I take care of part of that machine. That I only have like eight to 16 things to worry about. Um, so I can afford the luxury of having my stack allocation and context switching for thread because I only have eight to 16 of them at a time or something. But if I was doing a web server or telecommunication thing or whatever, where I have 10,000 clients to deal with, then I would finally make myself learn how to do async await. <laughs> I just haven't run into the need yet for what I need to do because for me, just my background is easy to be the reason about well divided tasks, well divided threads to do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. How does Rust handle that? Is? So if you're spawning threads, but you know, you're, you're going to obviously have different numbers of threads depending on where you're deploying. How does it handle that if you, well, you know, you spawn a thread and there's not a physical one available? Well, the operating system will let you create new threads up to some large number. Right. So 
Do you want to explain the difference between a green thread and, a, and an OS thread? Well, is it, is it going to just handle queuing behind the scenes, or is it going to create a? It's going to create a, it, Rust will every time you say spawn, Rust will create an OS thread. Okay. And the OS just has to manage threads of my way. Whereas something like Go or Erlang, the green so-called green threads. Is doing essentially the same thing that Node is. It's having a concurrent system where rather than allocating a completely separate thread and take it from the OS manage it, it's going to manage it in this whole runtime. Where it will it'll allocate as many as threads as the C as the CPUs are for it to use and just have a runtime for each one of those. And they're much faster switching back and forth. But you know, but, but Rust, when you do a thread, are you familiar with the move semantics? So in order to make sure the borrow checker, to make sure you use something that are thread safe, it talks about if you're sharing something which is immutable, no problem. Everyone can share read only something at the same time, no big deal. But if you have something which is going to mutate, there is a tax where I would say, hey, I'm going to move this, say, I'm transferring ownership of this into this other thread. So that thread's responsible for taking care of it. You can write to it, worry about what it's done, and delete the memory, but no one else in any other thread can access that. And that was another. So learning about the bar checker, just general memory was one thing. And then you had to sort of learn extra level to go to threads to realize that, hey, I have to make sure when I'm sharing things, I am sharing it either immutably or I'm very, very clear about only this thread is not writable access to it. So if you're programming for like some other microcontroller, does it still have that concept of OS managed threads? Depends on the OS for your microcontroller. If you're running on the bare machine, it depends upon the OS. So if you're a bare metal, no OS, you don't have threads. If you could, however, write your own runtime. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's and, something and like a black or something like that. Yeah. yeah. So I do want to cover green threads versus OS threads. But I think Daryl did a pretty good job summarizing it. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to say, I don't really know the difference that well, because in different languages, it means more different things. Like a green yeah, thread in Ruby or Python is not like a Go routine. Yeah. The green threads are things which are not OS threads. It's some sort of runtime the language or library has come up with to manage concurrent programming. In the different languages, because they have different limitations, have different rules about how that works. But yes, it's different in Erlang versus Go, but you are not spitting off an OS thread for every thread that you spin off in these languages. So you have, you know, the process has 16 threads. OS has a bunch of like, commands, however many threads, and then you have root which is VM, runtime, I guess uh, one thing we could talk about is. Uh, Preemptive versus non preemptive. Uh, Say that one more time. Uh, I said that uh, another thing we could talk about is uh, preemption, preemptive uh, model versus non preemptive model. So, Rust, I guess, would be like uh, <coughs> cooperative, right? Because it, you have to yield uh, cooperatively, whereas uh, GoRoutines would be uh, uh, preemptive, as in the runtime can interrupt your uh, task at any time. Okay, so let me try to summarize that. So we're the, talking about preemptive versus non-preemptive and cooperative threads. Rust threads would be considered cooperative, whereas Go routines would be, what, what did you say they were? So uh, I wouldn't say Rust threads. I would say like uh, async await or futures in Rust. Uh, I guess I would call them tasks, right? That's what we call. Uh, that's what the literature calls them tasks. So Rust yeah. tasks uh, would be cooperative because every time you set up an await point, uh, you're yielding, right? Uh, yielding uh, the CPU. Uh, whereas in Go routines, you don't have an explicit yield. The the runtime decides when uh, when basically the context which happens. Okay, so yeah, when you're doing async await, that's like a cooperative model. Yes, if you were on one processor. Okay, got it. I mean, in, in, in Rust, it's weird because if you had four logical threads, you essentially would have four queues or four runtimes where when the event gets handed off to something, the 
your runtime deciding which one of those four queues to put it into to round robin to service it. But so within each of those threads, there's a walker thing going on, but they can happen in parallel. Those four can happen in parallel. What was that you were saying about only one, uh, a core only handling one thread at a time? Or are you referring to like, it's a single core processor with two threads, only one of those threads is actually being processed at any given time? Exactly. Hybrid threading just makes it much faster to switch between the threads. Well. You can just hand away hypothetical as two logic cores. From our perspective, then hold on. So is the, the advantage there is just that you have the information queued on those threads versus just having well, every CPU could be processing one thread. So if you've got 16 CPUs, theoretically you can have 16 things going on at once. And with the, the hyper threading, I think it keeps its execution in cache. When it switches, when it does the context switch better. So you could have 32 things that are running at half the speed of 16 things running as opposed to having so much overhead on the context switch. It's, it's, it's semi parallel. I mean, it's, it's much faster switching than it was before the hybrid was running where you right, had to push all the main memory flow all back. But it's, there's deep pipelining stuff going on, but yeah, it's, much faster for it. You can consider essentially two different threads, but really they are just rapidly switching back and forth. So ideally, you don't want to use more threads than you have CPU cores available. What I've heard is number of CPU cores minus one, so that you've got some overhead for the operating system and for your main loop. So you sure. want to recursively embed electron into electron into electron over and over again until you reach CPU cores and then run your program. Right. Yes. So <laughs> you want you want to always use the maximum number of threads, regardless of the cost. Plus one. Max threads plus one. <laughs> and you'll be fine. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I heard something today about running electron and electron, but I. Yeah. <laughs> running electron and electron, just because you could. So I'm, I'm not sure I'm ready for that. Electron to the nth power. Yeah. So. Cool. Uh, can someone so who knows uh, what? So can, can someone who knows about this stuff talk about uh, what stackless and stackful uh, oh. means in this oh, context? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know anything about stackless versus stackful. And what how does it apply to like uh, Rust async await? Yeah. Yeah. What stackless Python? Who's the Python guy? No, I never. I never. Really There's nothing that can be stackless. You need some place for the pointer to go. Well, you can just put them all in the heap. Just some I guess a global static table. None of us know what stackless really means. You can't you can't return for a function unless that'd be very weird. I would direct you to the Jeff Goldblum gif where it says your scientists never asked whether or not they should. <laughs> <laughs> So, so from what I what I understand, uh, stackless uh, could mean one thing, which is uh, uh, essentially whenever you call a function uh, uh, from another function, you're not necessarily pushing uh, uh, on the, your context node to a call stack or anything. Instead, you're just uh, expanding the next function in line, right? Uh, so it's it's like a linear progression of execution instead of going back and forth. Okay, I'm actually, because of the way the audio is set up, you are coming in very soft. Oh, sorry. I could, but then we're gonna get this audio feedback loop is the problem. So that's that's why I'm, I'm doing this, because this way it auto cancels itself. But it, All right, maybe, maybe I should be more efficient then. Let me compress everything into, <laughs> Continuation passing style. That that's the word I hear. Uh, that's the term I hear when I look up stackless. Okay. Continuation passing style is synonymous maybe with stackless. Also, we've got uh, there's a wedding in the next room because this is also an event space, and in the evenings it goes from being office space to event space. So the uh, wedding music is getting increasingly louder every few seconds. <laughs> So what are we doing here, and why are we not partying at the wedding? <laughs> That's a good question. 
Just kidding. This is awesome. I love learning this. Yeah, maybe maybe we should just go crash the wedding at this point. <laughs> well, you, you can't you can't talk about concurrent and multi parallel programming in Rust without talking about Rayon. Oh. oh, I can because I have no idea what Rayon is and I've never heard of well, it until just this moment. We should turn it over to Daryl. He can show us. But... Okay, Daryl. My favorite feature. Take it away. Darryl. Tell us about Rayon. Rayon. Preach the gospel. The gospel of Rayon. So, <laughs> imagine you have a task which is just very parallel by nature. Let's suppose you have a vector full of data and you need to do the same operation on each one of those things. So, wait, 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 wait. Wait, could this be um, the mammal broad set? Is that is that a good? Yeah, well, sure. You could process each vector independently. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you could do that. You could you could have a vector of coordinates. It could you could it could be something simple like you have a vector full of Fahrenheit temperatures. You want to convert them all to centigrade or Celsius. Your preference. Well, those are all independent of each other. And normally, what you would do in single thread Rust is that you would declare an iterator. And you would iterate each through each one of those positions doing something. And the magic of the Rayon library is that, provided you put the correct uses things up on the top, rather than saying iter, you say par iter. And uh, sure, par parallel iter, a parallel iterator. That what that will do behind the scenes the very first time you use that, it will start up the thread pool behind you and it will take all those positions in the array and divide up work to run all the different threads in the thread pool and it has a uh, work ceiling going on so if for some reason not all those things take a set of equal amount of time to run it will recognize that some of these uh thread some of these work pool threads are have nothing to do while another one still bunch of subjects will still work out of that queue and allocate to the other ones to keep going there is an overhead to this um so yes, it, you don't, yeah, you want, don't to want to do it on a vector of ten. Items. There, it, there is an overhead to setting this up to do, but if you're doing something really massive, which like video processing, um, is worth the tens of milliseconds for that to kick up and get going, because it, because unlike other things, you have to do. You're not really aware you're doing parallel programming because you just prototype your algorithm, single threaded. And then you just go in and change the iterator from the from iter or into iter into part iter, and then it all works. That's cool. Now, now your, comp your, 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 your compilation you. message is a little messy if you make a mistake, but you just make it work single thread first, regular iterators, and then switching over to ground is fairly easy. Cool. And then let's control like, the capacity you want to allow Rayon to have. Rayon will automatically figure out how many CPUs you have and how many threads it should spin up. So like if I want to use 40% of my resources for Rayon, is that something I can handle at the Rust level? Or is that something I, I believe, believe there's a config you can call to control how many threads will set up to do if you want to do that. It's meant normally just the default case, just allocate one per virtual core, go ahead and do stuff because you're trying to get stuff done as fast as possible. And it's one of those things that hides you from the abstractions of how that works. Now, if you have a lot of communication between the items, that's not for that. You're talking about the embarrassingly parallel use case where every item that you're iterating through is completely independent from every other item. It's really, it's really a masterpiece to make that work. Yeah, the use case I was just thinking of is if you're in like a desktop environment, like a desktop app, you never want your desktop app to be up 100%. Right? Yeah. Um, and in Rust, is there something that if you're using rayon like daryl said you can use some rayon configuration to control what rayon does but yeah, in control the size itself, of, controller size of the thread you're yeah. just doing it all manually so you're choosing what to do with your thread you can so take you a thread to your own manager thread. yourself right or you can go look for somebody else's right. library that does so you know, as part of the program you're reading in this you know, this desktop configuration so uh, credit where credit's due, Haskell did it first. <laughs> the Haskell panel library. Uh... Take, it, take it over there. I am at the point where I don't understand things uh, in general because that means right, so well that I can't Sorry, I was just saying that uh, credit where credit's due, uh, Haskell did it first. <laughs> okay. He said, he said Haskell did it first. Credit where credit's due. <laughs> yeah. 
Haskell is a beautiful language. Rust learned yeah, a lot, from but no one uses it. <laughs> that's well, not fair. I started to actually think like, oh, that seems really nice. And I started to run Haskell and then I found Rust. And I'm like, there's just, there's only so much time I can spend getting proficient at things. And so it's like, for me, it's, I can get proficient in Rust. I'm already doing Go. And I've got JavaScript, obviously. And it's like, what else do you need at that point? So Haskell has wonderful guarantees. But if you are after pure performance, it does take more memory. And then the thing is like, we're going to use Haskell up right now. Just yeah. Just ha ha Haskell requires more memory because it's garbage collected. And because of the all the languages that only deal with immutable objects do require more allocations. So that slows things down as well. Uh, the, 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 rel the most revolutionary thing I think about Rust is the borrow checker. The idea that, yes, I don't have to force everything to be a new read-only memory allocation because I can safely share things because the borrow checker will make sure that I cannot access them in a mutually bad way. Well, are we ready to uh, wrap up or any more questions? Because no this is so distracting to me at this point that I... Yeah, let's, let's try to avoid this venue. It's noisy. Well, I've got two other options queued up. I'm going to go visit one on Monday. I can probably get a tax system to mine, but it's in common rights, so I don't know if people are more down this direction to go to this meeting. The closest GitHub offices in Poland. Yeah, uh, my, my company is small. We only have room for our conference room, we only have only 12 people. I mean, I've got yeah, an office. It's northern Salt Lake. Lake. We can only fit about four. Well, <laughs> I've got my apartment that's like a block away from me, that can fit about this size of people. We have the break room, but also has a big TV that can probably be coming in the outside of the conference room. Well, there's a, there's a building called Tribe House. Well, the building probably has a different name, but the most recognized name on the building is Tribe House. And there's a company there that would be willing to sponsor us for location. So I'm going to go meet with them on Monday. Um, but. We've also got some problems with some of the other meetups. There's something like four or six other meetups that are looking for a place to meet. What other meetups do that? I'm not saying it's just going to be. Well, so they're still, they're still using Residivent, but when we lost our person there, that was a really nice place to lose. Yeah. Thank you. I'm seeing increasing number of postings for remote Rust programmers, but as far as a company in Utah locally that uses Rust, there's there's still not a large number. I haven't seen any. I've seen ads mostly around uh, blockchain type stuff. Yeah. But, which is so weird. But a lot of those, I, I don't know if they have an actual office or who is working at the home or something. Well, yeah, I, you know, those type of people. I think I'm going to go ahead and cut the feed. Sketch and Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, a good use case, and that means thank you for uh, hosting it. Join in. Thanks for joining in. Uh, we're glad to have you. I'm sorry if on YouTube and Twitch this has been clipping the whole time because I had the audio volume adjusted for my microphone lapel mic, not the desktop mic. <laughs> oh, no. But uh, anyway, thanks, thanks for joining in. Uh, remember, if you like what you like, you get more of what you like. So like it if you like it. And if you'd like to subscribe, uh, you, you should be, you might be watching this on the Rust channel or on my personal channel. So check the doobly-doo for the links to whichever one you want to actually be uh, subscribing. With that, adios. Are you familiar with uh, Amazon serverless, Lambda functions, so forth? What's the name, what's the name of the technology they created with Rust?
you had to do something with Rust today with Node, would you use Wasm or Neon? I would use Wasm. Is there a performance difference? I don't know, but I know that Wasm is the future and Neon is not. Okay. Or I guess I shouldn't say I, I don't know that, but I highly, highly suspect. I did see a talk, or like a conference talk, from the creator of Docker who said that if Wasm existed at the time he was creating Docker, that he wouldn't have made Docker. And we're just going to be the future. So and the world would be a better place because we wouldn't have but gigabyte images to run 10 kilobyte commands. So if you're working, if you're trying to interface, you know, for a function interface between JavaScript and Rust, is there the interface any different really between using Neon and using Wasm? Is one easier to work with than the other? Are the interfaces essentially the same, working the same modules? I don't know. I, I would think that, wait, say that question again. So when you're, when you're talking from JavaScript to Rust, so AJ, is your it looks like your screen is frozen. JavaScript is calling the Rust function in Wasm. If you're doing it Neon, be. the code that you show shows that hey, you're getting this JavaScript object coming into Rust and you're calling things on that thing to use. Is it frozen, AJ? This looks frozen on my end. The walls among less talk. No, you should go watch that. It's on the YouTube channel. Um, yeah, my screen might be frozen. I'm not worried about it. I'm not showing anything on the screen anyway. So. Oh, okay, got it. Okay. Oh gosh, the music's so loud. I only so just recently. You get a copyright strike. I found. Uh, uh, PWA generator in uh, Rust that generates the Wasm, and so you can make your entire PWA in Rust, and it just compiles the Wasm binary, and you just strip back it into your page and run the Wasm instead of like a JavaScript. So it's my understanding that if you just declare threads to do things normally with your OS in Rust, you compile the Wasm in some Directly calling those, you know, you're able to talk in Rust based OS programs to threads and then translate that to the workers. But probably um, directly to the browser. I don't so. know. I, I did like beginner tutorials, got the Wasm, and like, oh, that's pretty cool. And then that's about for that. Because I know that in JavaScript, to set up stuff to those background commands, there's some overhead stuff you have to deal with. Right. right. Yeah. And I'm, but I, I would imagine that if you really wanted this to work in any language, you just figure that kind of general rule and bind into that thing. If I want to do multi threading in Wasm with Rust code, am I just declaring OS threads, multi spawning threads like it normally would, and it figures out how to turn that into Wasm worker threads, or do you have to call you know, Wasm functions? There has to be some Wasm function. But I'm wondering, is, 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 Rust, they, is Rust taking the, the, the abstraction at the level that you're doing the Rust abstraction of threads? Is that being translated directly to it, or do you have to call? They haven't threads? gotten any of that in the extended library. That's the huge target of Wasm. Not that I'm aware, aware of. Well, that's why I missed what you had like over two years ago. <laughs> yeah, I am not a Wasm expert for sure. So I want how, how does one do multi threading from Rust? We'll figure it out between now and the next meetup and I'll let you know. Cool. We'll have a speaker for next month. <laughs> no, 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 no. School's starting. I can't do it next month. <laughs> well, then better do it now because it's going to be harder after school starts. At least you have a week now. Two weeks. I'll you know. post it. I'll, I'll make a video and post it. What's your thesis again? I forgot. Uh, well, it's kind of along with Fisher. I found out, I realized, like, I made the connection that the astrology symbol for for um, cancer, the crab, the rest of the cancer, um, in, in the best way possible. So basically, my thesis is proving that the Rust community is a good cult, and because it exhibits it and other technical communities exhibit 
religious and or cult-like behaviors and how to use community to predict technology success. Okay, so Eric address Russ versus Elm people, for instance. Right. Okay. Or C people, or uh, Linux people, or well, because et cetera. What, what Elm and Clojure have in common mm -hmm. is that in both cases, you have one individual who created the language pretty much in a per control right. of, the, of the language at that, at, from that point on. So there's only one guy essentially maintaining the core of the bill. Right. There's only one guy maintaining the core of closure, and that partly was limited to Chrome because the folder was the same key for closure. Oh. I forget yeah, the 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 yeah, the benevolent dictator. Yeah, it's also a benevolent dictator. But yeah, I, I'm trying to flesh out exactly how to make the thesis succinct because I'm not quite done with my bachelor's degree yet, anyways. But working towards. Yes, I, I think in Russ we're fanatics, but not focus. Right. I, I agree, <laughs> agree. Um, the stuff that I'm using for a basis for it is kind of saying like most groups that were in as humans in general tend to exhibit cult like behaviors individually, but kind of have to have all of those behaviors to be like a cult. And so like, and cult also in both general and academic senses has a very negative connotation. Anyone who has a specific culture is a cult. Right. So yeah. when to you very think of culture, it's like, well, Utah right. has a culture. Right. Uh, yeah. So and it's there's like, several well, like, all of it's a spectrum of like cult cult, what most people think of as a cult versus like, Community culture kind of thing. Rust is a Linux was playing around with playing Rust Linux with the Perl of the yeah. drivers. They are concerned about panics right now with a couple of their issues, but once they get that resolved, the minute that starts going to Linux Perl, I think that's one of the watershed events people saying is closure is the right time to add one thing. And once that happens, we are not too much. Then, well, no, 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 I don't, <laughs> no, I'm I'm I don't see them going back to the right thing because it already works. Right. But All those issues are memory issues that Rust is making possible. So I figured that there's an appetite out there to want to do things in Rust going forward to address that stuff. It's very interesting. There is an alternative exotic operating system called Redox. It's a catch 22. People don't want to get huge investment in it until it's quite sure they have a large audience, which they quite think is won't be a large number. People doing that in Clover is a large market for it. It's all waiting for the next. There's a ton of legacy. Whoa, 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 whoa. But you got 25 million people. Oh, no, please, go the, on. <laughs> the, language, the language is good. What? The oh, way that on. people have abused it. Oh, come on. The, re the reason think... why JavaScript works so well is the fact we've got 25 million, whatever the number of people using it, yeah, have not combined with Stack Overflow and GitHub, where people can just go copy paste code that 20 other million people already use before they do it. I mean, you're, you're just Bombing that just real world testing, not because the compiler is going to tell you ahead of time that it's wrong, but just you're looking at a 30 million person who used that piece of code, so you're pretty sure all the edge cases are going to go. I'm still shocked that JavaScript is even that good. I know. Is it old? Is it old? The font size just browser? This little toy interactivity book we built around it. But oh. here's the thing it owns JavaScript the actually <laughs> is a good language. Every time things or a, a weekend or a week, like to develop it and like in no, no, decent. ten days more than a week. Sorry, <laughs> I, I'm just biased against saying like two business time. weeks. <laughs> if you're looking for watershed moments, though, we had one this year. The the Rust Foundation. That was a big oh, thing. Uh -huh. huge watershed moment. I, well, I, I, have, I, I, don't, a I don't think a lot of sport balls will be talking about having the girl that has happened. No, yeah, I think he was. And I, I, what, I what is GitHub, so I see a lot of the behind the scenes stuff of Microsoft, and they're pouring resources that really teams that are high. Yeah, I, I, well, I, I, see, I see the jobs that are all in Washington State. Pushing things through, like, to the main Rust 
kept playing the game it's pretty stable. Recently. Microsoft seems to have a strategy where their IoT strategy have IoT devices which put all their data up in the cloud. That's where I, the most things I've seen, that's where a lot of the Rust jobs seem to be, is to support their IoT. Mm -hmm. They recently bought an, an IoT operating system company. I don't remember the name of it, a lot of money for it. Microsoft also did the IoT space really bad. Yeah. Microsoft. Microsoft's kind of scares me. Google's got Fuchsia that I think recently released or semi released or something. Yeah, that was something. You know, it's Fuchsia about it. I have a friend in the Discord server that like works for Google and he does stuff on Fuchsia. And I don't think it's all addressed. I don't remember right. I didn't know it was any interest. It has large chunks in Rust, Rust Give, apparently. Cool. Given the military's fondness for Ada in the past and the reason why they liked it, I thought Rust is something they would probably want to do their satellites and other must not fail things in. But the same reason why they abandoned Ada to go to sea is you just can't go out and hire 2,000 Rust programmers right now. There's more lines of code in the F35 than there was in Microsoft X and Windows XP. That's horrible. So I did something wrong. Four right. lines of code means more so expensive. How, how big is what qualifies these days for a big website in terms of lines of JavaScript? It depends on who how, you it, can how well it's built. What, what I would say every days? website is a big website because they all use ginormous frameworks. That's true. That, that's true. It's I'm like talking you, about the, the code that yeah. people write themselves. How much code do they end up writing themselves to that website? Is it Zero to ten thousand, zero to twice, ten to twenty, twenty to fifty, fifty to hundred. What's large these days? Are you counting all the tool set that's developed to then compile your? I'm, your not, I'm not about the tool set and the framework. I'm talking about the code that you wrote for your for your stuff, not all the stuff. stuff let me, let me see. Your website, as to like just the general. Like so, for instance, are there million line JavaScript things out there? Sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. Nice. Okay, so They're now not, like a million line file, but you probably have thousands of files that will. They most of them nothing against boot camp developers, but when you get a lot of them together, you, you end up with a lot of uh, repeating yourself code. Okay, yeah. And it's not dry. Uh, to use a term I used earlier, data components. Uh, you end up with large files of the same code over and over again. So when you fix a bug, you have to fix it in ten different places, literally. And that's been most of my job for the last couple months is fixing bugs in ten different places, ten different times. And so why haven't you been trying? I've been trying to, uh, but I've been having to do it in my free time because yeah. I don't want to do any more rewrites. Is basically maybe you want to call it microservice these days. I don't know, but it really is. Something very simple like my script, my JavaScript. <laughs> when you get to 100,000 lines of code, now you're talking about you know a very serious application, likely to have a team of three to five people for that app, for that, that thing. Get over a million lines of code, okay, now you're getting into enterprise level stuff. Um, and then it, then it goes up, it goes up from there. And given the download issues and so forth. I'm just wondering, is it how many million plus lines of JavaScript code apps are out there, or on the note side? Is there a million lines of JavaScript in the back end of any website? You should go do a stack overflow server. <laughs> That's about the only way you're going to find it. So, I was, uh, I assume you guys know of Bluehost, even if you don't know of Bluehost. Bluehost? No. Um, their local Utah company that like started here. I didn't um, realize that. Yeah. So I worked for the company that bought them several years ago called Endurance. And Endurance just got bought by a bigger company. They basically kept getting swallowed. So um, the Endurance also bought a company called Site Builder and Website Builder and Sitelio. Basically, they all resold the same website builder, just as different slap different brand names on it. And like maybe had different default templates that you saw when you went into it. Um, but that product, like depending on how you want to break it up, because it's like there's all of the admin in the interface code that could easily be a million or more lines of code. And then there was the, let's see. So there's 
all of the settings type of stuff in your store code, which handles all of the, like if, if you sell products on your website and to manage that and to, you know, connect to Stripe and all of those things was its own kind of code base. And then you had the website builder, which was its own code base. And they combined together with other APIs, .NET APIs, to like generate your website. And essentially, they're generating um, like SPAs. Well, maybe not SPAs, but they're they're pre-rendering your website uh, and uploading that to I think Azure or something like that. And so that's why I'm like, where are you drawing the line? Because if you just mean the end website that the like person paying for it got that might be less than a million it might be less than a hundred thousand but then each of those tools and then there's a client that was built to handle that and it's different from the back end fly and so it's like, there's there's a lot there that easily millions of lines go like if you at the start of my work at work at it looks like it would be a under 50k lines of code app, but because of all the like repeating, if like I just did some ballpark estimations in my yeah, any stack analysis tools that measure code for code duplication? Uh, no, uh, unit testing has been hard to implement just because it's been set up so weird. Have you ever sonar file? Uh, yes. yes. Yeah, I, I like it a lot. It does a very good job of measuring code. Yeah, we probably need that. We we we've got it so that whenever people do a pull request automatically. One of the reviewers is Sonar Cloud that comments on what it doesn't like about your code. Your code. Mm. A year from now, I'm hoping to do a presentation on, I think it's pronounced Tori, Toria, or whatever it's called, yeah. where these guys said, you try to do an electron app, the whole electron with an electron, you've got this huge memory hog, huge download footprint. I think that's what's Microsoft like. Teams is based upon it. Digital Code is Studio Code is yeah. based upon it. Slack Microsoft Teams Slack. does it. Slack does it. I think but Slack these are just one of those. Rewriting the Rust? Within Electron. Is somebody yeah. rewriting Electron and Rust? Because that Tower, is a really yes. good yes. Discord has parts of it Rust. Too. What? Tower. 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 Yeah. So JavaScript on the front end, Rust on the back end. Or Tari, I, I don't know. And T O U R. T A. T A U tower like the uh, just like the that tower. tower space rust. It's a better version yeah. of pi. <laughs> what? No, no, a no. A U R I yeah. that space tower. rust. Yeah. I I'm I've been looking at rebuilding my electron yeah, app. Yeah, that one down there. Send that to Discord so we all have access to. Oh, where can all find it? You go to the main website. The second link. Rust eighty percent. They're getting near a one point oh, and they're mm -hmm. in beta right now. No, I don't, according, according to the roadmap, I don't think they'll be out of beta until 2022. Because <laughs> you look at their roadmap and they got a lot of things left on the roadmap yeah. they haven't finished yet. But yeah. they're, they're trying to, so in their Discord channel, they're talking about how they're getting ready for a uh, audit to make sure it's stable or something, like an actual external audit of the code. They will declare they're out of beta, yeah, they say they're Discord. stable on all platforms, which means they want to be stable on Windows, Mac, Linux, Android, and iOS. So wow. they basically want to enable people to do like React Native applications using this or whatever native framework you want to use. Uh, so it's again running Rust on the back end. And they're talking about that they would then open it up that you could run, if you wanted to, using, you could interact with them Python to your back end. And 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 C++ 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 your back end. And it's all running Power App. If you search, do you know what data yeah, lines or whatever? On, on. It's like, um, we could be under 50k lines, but right now, based on every view component, pile of product, every file on the back end is almost 10,000 lines by itself each. And we have like more than 10 of those each. We're at least 300k lines of code. I hired a week ago. I hired a That's true. Yeah. I hired a developer last year who, um, according to his Git uh, record, is responsible for minus 20,000 lines of code. <laughs> because, I would love my Git record like that. Because we, we shrunk our outlook in the past year. We shrunk by 20,000 lines of code. Most of guess this time. All right. Well, I'm going to, I guess, completely, totally end this now.